Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Adiba Kamarul Zaman. I'm the former president. Oh, the screen has gone off. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm, I'm sorry, I had a bit of technical uh, problem on my side. My name is Adiba Kamarul Zaman, and I'm very pleased to host this afternoon's uh, We Move Adolescent Health webinar hosted by the Desmond Tutu Health Foundation, NIV. I'm the former uh, um, immediate past president of the International AIDS Society, and I work at the University of Malaya in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia as an HIV physician and researcher. Thank you all for joining us today. And we're really looking forward to a stimulating afternoon. This is the fourth of six webinars in this year's We Move series. And today we are going to be focusing on a very important topic, adolescence and substance use. And we will hear talks from Dr. Sarah Bagley and Dr. Tara Kani. And in between their talks, there'll be an artistic intervention from Kondiswa James. This will be followed by a panel discussion where our speakers will be joined by Dr. Andrew Shibe and Vuyowetu Balani for the discussion. Now to start off with, um, we'd like to know a little bit more about what you think about the topic. And we have a quick poll question. Please look at the questions that will appear on your screens and complete it by clicking on your preferred responses on the screen. This will, of course, be completely anonymous. Give you all a few minutes. Okay, perhaps we can show the results. Now, really interesting question, the legalization of illicit substances such as cocaine, heroin, cannabis, and methamphetamines could be beneficial in the following ways. So close to 60% felt that it will reduce likelihood of overdosing by standardizing the dosage, followed by huh, introducing pharmaceutical grade quality control, um, and then all, uh, a third or slightly more than a third thought that it would also create a together between reducing likelihood of overdosing and introducing pharmaceutical grade will also create a significant source of tax um, income for the government. 
Now these are really interesting questions and I, I hope our speakers um, will also address some of these um, uh, answers and, and thoughts from our participants. Um, so maybe we can close that for now because we have a lot to cover. Um, and our first speaker will be Dr. Sarah Bagley, who's a primary care physician in the US at the Boston Medical Center. She's a medical director of the Catalyst Center for Addiction Treatment for Adolescents and Young Adults Who Use Substances. Uh, it's a clinic that provides integrated medical and behavioral health care for adolescents and young adults who use substances. So particular research interests are in the treatment of opioid use disorders in the adolescent and young adult population and the involvement of the family in addiction care. She's going to talk to us about key considerations for addressing adolescent substance use. So over to you, Sarah. Good morning. Thank you so much for having me. My name is Sarah Badley. I'm a primary care provider uh, and addiction specialist at Boston Medical Center. I'm just going to pull up my slides and start this presentation. Okay, so this morning we're going to talk about the top five considerations or things to be thinking about when we are working with youth who use drugs. Here's my disclosure and funding slide. I don't have any conflicts of interest in here, the funding sources that allow me to do the clinical and research work that I do. So here are the five sort of considerations or principles that I think about uh, every day when I'm doing either my clinical work with youth or, or my research. So the first is engagement is key, language and stigma matter, treatment works, harm reduction principles still apply for youth, and families can be allies. So we're going to start with engagement is key. So the, uh, this quote I really love, the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it's human connection. Some of you may be familiar with that quote. I think that for youth, this has been particularly helpful for me because I think a lot of the patients who I see come in and they're not necessarily looking to stop using their drug use, stop using drugs, but they really do want to make connections back with their family or with their friends and it's relationships that have really suffered maybe because of their substance use. And so I think a lot of our work can be sometimes focused on helping to reduce substance use so that those relationships can be established. But that's really the goal. The goal is not really about the substance use necessarily. It's really about sort of making those positive connections back out into the world. And we do that by helping to sort of people reduce their substance use. In a practical way, how does that play out? It might mean not getting all the history in the first visit but getting enough information so that we can offer a treatment plan or a harm reduction plan certainly means holding any kind of judgments that we might have, um, which, you know, I think can be a, an approach that a lot of us take, but also really does require sort of uh, stopping before we go into the room sometimes and thinking about um, our own biases, uh, offering any and all opportunities for youth to make decisions and maintain their autonomy. It's developmentally appropriate for them to want to make their own decisions. And so if there are ways that we can say, here are three choices and give the, some of that power back to them, that can be really important and help uh, develop rapport. And finally, flexible models, realizing that youth come to us with lots of different needs that may be related to their substance use or other things that are going on in their life. And if our treatment models can offer sort of flexible care, we're going to be able to do a better job with engaging them. You know, and as I'm as I'm thinking about those different approaches to engagement, I'm always remembering that brain development is ongoing and it continues into the 20s. And this has really important implications for the youth's ability to engage because it may be harder for them to think about consequences of use, that part of their brain, the prefrontal cortex, where there is sort of allowing them to uh, plan is going to be developing last. And so, so we sort of see this play out in a lot of risk taking and impulsivity. So that's actually normal. That's it's sort of what we want. To, it's what we expect. Um, 
but may make it harder to engage. And then finally, this idea that behaviors make sense. And so oftentimes, I think we have pathologized a lot of the behaviors around substance use. But when we take a step back and we ask our youth, tell me a little bit more about what are the benefits of smoking? What are the benefits of using pills? What are the benefits of drinking? We actually hear from them that they have some really good reasons, even if they're not even if the youth isn't safe, they have some good reasons for why they're engaging in drug use. And the more we understand their behaviors and motivation, the better we're going to be able to match any kind of advice or treatment um, to, to their plan. The next thing I want to talk about is language and stigma and how they matter <clears throat> when we're talking about youth. So what I have found is this idea of like the recovery language may not resonate. I also take care of adults and for a lot of adults sort of thinking about themselves in, in recovery or longer term recovery and being part of that community is really helpful. I think for youth who, who, are, who are young, who may not want to think about themselves as having, having a chronic disease, that this, this language can be, can be limiting. And so what it means is that I try to find out what are the youth's goals? How are they thinking about their substance use, about the idea of recovery, about sobriety? What, is it, what are the kind of words they want to use? And really trying to align with that. Because the goal, again, is really trying to engage them so that I can offer them advice to minimize the harms of their substance use and potentially treatment if that's what they're interested in as well. But understanding, again, their language, how they're thinking about it, how they identify is a critical first step. And this is a, there, a quote from a participant in a study that we did with uh, young adults who have opioid use disorder. Um, and I think it represents this idea really nicely. They don't want their life to continue to be defined by their substance use, including if that means being defined by not using substances. Because having your identity be centered around being in recovery is also not like your life still being centered around substance using. It works for some people. It's great. But I don't think that's what most people want. I think the conversation isn't about people won't die. It's like people will be present for their lives again. And then finally, this idea of hard to reach. So I think oftentimes when I talk about working with youth, I sort of hear a lot about how there's this hard to reach, hard to engage population. And I sort of ask whether or not we can flip that idea and we can start to actually think about ourselves as hard to reach. Um, and this idea that what I hear from my patients is I'm not hard to reach. It's just generally people don't know how to reach me. And then finally, stigma. I think we know that there is tremendous stigma against people who have substance use disorder and even for people who use um, medications to treat opioid use disorder. I know in the, uh, where I am, this is a huge barrier to actually accessing care. And so we know that this stigma actually does act as a barrier to treatment and is really important to address both with our patients, but then their families and then in the communities where we're working as well. So the next idea is that treatment works and it works for youth. Um, and so what's our approach to treatment? Well, we often start with screening, brief intervention and referral to treatment. And so we start with a validated screening tool and then that helps us to identify the risk level and appropriate intervention. If we hear back that there's really no use and there's abstinence, we can offer positive reinforcement, find out a little bit more about why the youth is abstinent and what they might do in different situations where there may be substance use. If there's substance use but no disorder, we can offer some brief, brief health advice, also sort of focusing on safety. Um, if there's mild to moderate substance use disorder, a, a brief intervention that's a little bit longer, really based on the principles of motivational interviewing can be helpful. And then for youth who have a more severe substance use disorder, referral to treatment and more specialized care may be appropriate. We use the same criteria to diagnose substance use disorder in youth. Um, although we often find that youth may minimize the impact of any substance use, and so it can sometimes be helpful to gather additional history from a parent or other caregiver so that we can really paint the full picture of how the substance use may be impacting the youth's life. 
there are sort of two buckets of uh, treatment approaches. So one is behavioral, the other is pharmacologic. Here are examples of some of the behavioral approaches that are evidence-based and can be implemented for youth populations, including motivational interviewing, CBT, DVT, and contingency management. All of them have evidence for uh, youth who have substance use disorder. We also have medications for substance use disorders. Um, in the United States, the only medication that is approved for youth 16 and up is for buprenorphine for opioid use disorder. We use off-label medications to treat uh, cannabis use disorder, alcohol use disorder, and nicotine use disorder as well. Um, this slide is specific for opioid use disorder. Um, and although this treatment is effective for youth, there are some sort of unique considerations um, our data is more limited, although it's all really positive. Um, and we just we also know that uh, youth have sort of the highest attrition from clinical care. And so just sort of getting back to this idea of engagement language is really important um, when we're thinking about when we're thinking about treatment. Uh, one of the main challenges that we have when we're thinking about using medications for youth is we don't have an ideal length of time. Um, and so that can be difficult when we're sort of doing initial counseling with families and youth. The next idea is harm reduction. And I think oftentimes, I know when um, I'm thinking about harm reduction, I, I can't help it, but I imagine sort of I'm an adult in my head. But the reality is that we can use a lot of the uh, principles that we think about in the harm reduction and also implement them in our approaches to youth. And so, for example, that means meeting them where they are being compassionate and really just trying to focus on different kinds of strategies to reduce any harms that might be arising because of their substance use. Specific strategies that might be helpful, overdose education and naloxone kits uh, can be really helpful and we've trained a lot of families in how to use naloxone and send everyone home actually with a naloxone kit from our clinic, certainly offering HIV prevention and PrEP. Um, trying to facilitate access to clean syringes and supplies for injecting or smoking drugs, using fentanyl test strips, which are a way that we can do drug checking as we sort of see the, the presence of fentanyl is really sort of rising in our drug supply. Um, and most of the overdose deaths to youth in the US are, are driven by fentanyl. Um, and just recognizing that abstinence might not be the goal for many adolescents and young adults. And so on one hand, although we can continue to offer the advice that you no know, use is gonna be safest, we also know that it just might not be reasonable and we wanna make sure that, again, that we are able to engage the youth and try to keep them safe. Um, and that's the primary goal, not convincing them to stop using drugs um, and then also safer sex supplies. Uh, these are a couple of quotes that just sort of remind us that youth can have really sort of um, profound experiences with drug use. And so being able to engage with them around those experiences and validating those experiences is really important. This is a study of youth who had had an overdose, had a history of overdose. And so the first participant said, and then I really got to the point where I didn't care if I was gonna die, I just had to get something in my body. The next participant said, and ultimately, there's really nothing that's going to be enough to make me change. And I had to make the decision to change because my rock bottom is death. I mean, I've died. I've overdosed. So both of these participants who are, you know, 17 and 18 years old have had really profound experiences related to their substance use. And so it really is critical that we as a uh, people who are working with them and trying to serve them really sort of design our system so that they are able to have these kind of conversations with us so that we can offer them strategies to stay safe and engaged in harm reduction or in treatment if that's what they want. Finally, I just want to highlight the idea of families and how they can really be key allies, often underutilized allies in approaches to use substance use. And so why is that? Well, they know the youth best. That isn't surprising for any of you who are part of families um, or who may have kids. You know that um, they, they know their youth and they understand the motivations. They've been around to sort of see the different patterns. And so they have valuable information, but also can be really reinforcing uh, presences at home as well. 
when they're not in clinic with us. Um, and even when relationships have deteriorated, which sometimes happens uh, when youth are using substances, it's important to understand how their presence, their decision making, their beliefs may impact youth. And we can invite them with permission to be part of the treatment and planning process. And that can be a really powerful approach and also really healing for the family. There are strategies that focus specifically on supporting families and even on families when um, a youth may not be ready for treatment yet. Um, and here is a list of some of those uh, approaches. So the first is community reinforcement approach and family training, which is specifically developed actually for family members whose uh, loved ones are not ready to stop using and offers different communication approaches and ways to provide positive reinforcement for reduction in substance use in a home environment. Um, overdose education and naloxone rescue kits, again, sort of safety, safety, safety. And then there are mutual support groups like Al-Anon um, and, and other groups that might be local to, to where you are that can be really helpful so that families just don't feel alone, which I think I've heard from a lot of our families, just tremendous anxiety and a lot of isolation. And so it can be really helpful for them to be able to connect with other family members or parents or caregivers um, to share, share that experience together. I want to thank you so much for having me uh, today. I really look forward to um, uh, the rest of the presentation and uh, the questions and answers that are going to come up afterwards. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sarah, for the excellent overview of, of the problems and the um, walking us through some of the practical ways in which um, we need to we can address this. Um, I know there will probably be a lot of questions for you, but we're going to keep it till the end of the presentations. But before we go to um, Tara, we have um, an interlude by a very special performance uh, performer who is a multi-talented, award-winning theatre maker, performance artist, film and theatre performer, installation artist, writer, arts facilitator, and activist. I'm really looking forward to this. Um, and uh, her name is Kondiswa uh, James, who is a cultural worker living in Cape Town, South Africa. And her work engages the socio-political imagination towards mobilizing transgression. So enjoy. Twenty-first January, twenty sixteen, Kumbu Village. This is the rest of the country which has been forgotten. Places previously termed homelands, said to be brought to the light of democracy, but have instead been conveniently left behind. No need to silence these places. You did that already when you failed to restore their voice stolen by your predecessors. I am in the trans sky, Danago Kumbu, and it is tragic. Common man tragic and every day I fear that even the revolution will leave us behind like democracy, like apartheid, like colonization. Ours is a long history of never seen, never heard, over there somewhere, grouped in areas and acted out shunned. Emakosen, as Amachi Pasekapa like to call us. Siku ute ewe kotwa nani, na lathlegeli kolite za sekoli, na libale makichi na sekapa na pat. Nisishiri where a 17-year-old boy just walked into a school, a toilet sport, a school in the culture, casual swagger, and a gun in his hand. Kumbu Village is one of those schools as a trans guy that you wouldn't check to see Uba's Pume Peping, where the systemic mind rape of colonization through apartheid to democracy is lived. Learners and their parents in schools boycott schools demanding better qualified teachers because they will not stand to be relegated as part of the statistic. Matric pass rate at an all time low. Apa, we are failing. And because we are failing, you are failing. And with it, white monopoly capital. We were not equipped with tools to do battle with cities' beasts. Nasishia, forgotten, never heard, never seen. Nalibahala, that we are part of you and you are bigger than us. 
and we cannot stand the crushing weight of influence like white monopoly capital that comes to steal labor and rape land. There is Devonez Gugum, development, they call it. And I listen to old women telling their children, I am done, I I call you mad. So development for who? To trap us in a cycle of wanting what we can't have, working in those same places we can't afford, living paying checks to paycheck. Inyaupe is figel is lalini, and with it white monopoly capital and 17-year-old boys carrying guns into schoolyards. It is 11.17 a.m. and I have just passed my learner's license. And in the middle of a school day in the yard next to ours, we hear a sound like tight air spit from a piston and school children running, pounding feet like stampedes for war cries, war crimes. I look outside the grimy street of window panes of buildings in the trance eye and I think I imagine June 16 turned on its head black and black violence and the silencing gavel of white supremacy and all of its gatekeepers, Nisi Libel, forgot even to make law for us, have made war for us. A 17-year-old boy shoots a school teacher at 11.20 a.m. and they police, their yard, a two-minute shuffle to the right of us, arrive 15 minutes later. The boy is already gone. Casual swing of his arms by his sides, gun loose between his thumb and forefinger, Umfana, 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 elusin komo, itafeni, turned war, forgot law, and the shining star of the SAPS with him. I don't believe in law. I believe in justice. 400 school kids lay witness to this. Imagine, imagine, ima, imagine the tremor like the righteous renewal of umhlaba come earthquakes as the running feet of school children. Imagine the trauma. I think I imagine June 16 turned in on itself, the white wig of white democracy, safeguarding white monopoly, splintering gavels to label violence with the face of the black child. No, you did this. My mother, black woman of black children who has never lived anywhere else but here my mother tells me democracy has done nothing for her she doesn't envy us our democracy and says the spitting and burdened and struggling and troubled says this with vitriol in her marrow we built this country this continent, migrant labor, oh mama, no data be to about twala be to tabesia to Kimberley, chasing white man lies like diamond stars too far out of reach. The agricultural backbone of this country, on which whole economy scales tilt and sway and still in the equilibrium of black lives breaking backbone to safeguard the silver spoons in the mouths of Rupert and all of his children. Black bodies built here, shaped and sharpened for revolution in lecture halls, efforte, and res rooms, a This country and all its revolutions are built on the backs of blacks that come from the land and are called back to the land. Imvela Pia says Lalin. Forgotten where you come from to lie blood dust, wasted manure for the garden of the colony. Cape Town is not your home, nor Joburg, nor Durban. There are sand castles in the sky once touched, turned bust, dust particles for wind dances. Your cities are not real. Mshab is your home. And there are black children laying to waste their lives for city dreams come hallucinations, snorted air v ratix poison driven insane minds inside out june 16 turned in on itself imagine the trauma cry for the black child driven to kill we all did this Thank you for that, um, Kondiswa James. Um, very thought-provoking words. Um, we uh, now will move on to um, Dr. Tara Kani, who will, who is a specialist scientist in the alcohol, tobacco, and other re drug research unit 
of the South African Medical Research Council. She's also an honorary senior lecturer at the Psychiatry and Mental Health Department at the University of Cape Town. And her primary research experience is in the field of substance use, including looking at relationships between substance use and physical and mental health. Tara has a particular interest in con conducting research with adolescents and young people, and is of course eminently suited to speak to us about the adolescent substance use in South Africa, and needs it, it, the need for inclusion and um, challenges and opportunities. So over to you, Tara, and uh, please don't forget to put in your questions in the Q&A box so that we can um, have a, an interesting dialogue after Tara's presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for the invitation from Desmond Tutor Health Foundation to speak today on adolescent substance use in South Africa. It really is a privilege especially because I currently co collaborate with two wonderful Desmond Tutu Health Foundation senior staff members on some of my research studies. It is always challenging to select what to focus on, as there is so much work to do in this area, as in South Africa, adolescents make up approximately 18% of the population, and their health and well-being is critical to the future of the country. I've therefore decided today to provide an overall picture of adolescent needs and existing evidence-based intervention models to address substance use in South Africa. Also look at the importance of including adolescents themselves in research and current contextual challenges, as well as future opportunities for research. I'm going to start by providing some context around adolescent substance use in South Africa. Due to national youth behavior surveys, which do include substance use prevalence being quite outdated, with the most recent ones being conducted approximately a decade ago, the best source of information is really SECENDU, um, which stands for the South African Community Epidemiological Network on Drug Use. So nationally, um, if you look at this graph, it represents the proportion of adolescents, so under 20 years old, who attend substance use treatment by province in the country. And this is updated every six months to follow trends. The proportion of persons under 20 years ranged from 13% in the KwaZulu-Natal province to 27% uh, in the Eastern Cape. Throughout most of the country, cannabis is the most common primary substance of use for adolescents receiving treatment, and this is followed by alcohol. Other drugs do vary by province. So for example, in KwaZulu-Natal and the Northern region, heroin is more prevalent while in the Western Cape and Gauteng, methamphetamine is more prevalent. Mandrax, or methaquilone, a tranquilizer that is usually smoked together with cannabis, is only really reported in the Cape provinces, but has also been reported in community studies with adolescents. Before we focus on adolescent substance use, it is important to consider that it also occurs within the following contexts. So South Africa is a country that has extreme economic disparities. Communities have high, many communities have high levels of poverty and associated social conditions, including unemployment, crime, and gang activity, meaning that many adolescents face a number of challenges in the environment that they live in. There are many informal taverns or sabines in certain communities where alcohol is sold. Some of these are licensed, but many are not. And these shabins or um, informal taverns emerged particularly after apartheid legislation in 1948, um, where people could really gather to discuss important issues and express themselves through art or music and buy alcohol. The system of top stop or labor payment with alcoholic beverages, which occurs particularly in the Western Cape province um, and particularly in sort of wine producing regions, has a long legacy. So while the system was abolished a number of years ago, the result is that there are normative heavy drinking patterns in a number of communities where farming and wine production are prevalent. Next is the consideration of cannabis policy. 
Um, so in October 2020, the Cannabis for Private uh, Purposes Bill was introduced to South African Parliament. And this allows um, adults to possess, cultivate, and possess a prescribed quantity of cannabis, as well as to use cannabis. So this pertains to adults, not to adolescents, um, but there is no regulations around adolescents using cannabis. What we do know is regular cannabis exposure during adolescence is associated with more severe and persistent negative outcomes than use during adulthood. But we do need more evidence of on this, especially in South Africa. Taking into account that alcohol and cannabis are the most widely used substances amongst adolescents in South Africa, if you, looked at, if you look at the previous slide, these points are quite pertinent. Now, all of this occurs within a context where, although great progress has been made around HIV and TB, South Africa still has amongst the highest burden of disease globally, these communicable diseases. So we know in South Africa, but also globally, that adolescents who use alcohol or drugs are often at risk for other problem behaviours, and these risks often cluster together. Additionally, the earlier adolescents begin to engage in regular substance use, the more likely it is to progress into a substance use disorder. So we are particularly interested in the health and the well-being of adolescents and their progression later on in life. It makes sense, therefore, that it's important to consider the impact that substance use may have in other areas of their life. This slide just shows some of the physical and mental health issues that researchers found to be related to adolescent substance use, including in South Africa. Specifically, studies have been concerned around substance use and sexual risk, which can obviously result in pregnancy, sexually transmitted infections, including HIV, um, and other sexual risk behaviours. Interpersonal violence is also an area that is of great concern in the country, um, especially since South Africa has very high levels overall of violence and harm towards others. And this is a, really a large cause of mor mortality in the country. Depression and anxiety have also been linked to substance use, as well as childhood adverse events and other exposure to trauma which are real concerns for mental health of adolescents. Other areas that substance use has been associated with is poor academic performance and eventual school dropout. So if we look at the most recent statistics, almost 30% of, of um, adolescents aged 18 years and almost half of adolescents aged 19 years um, report having dropped out of school in South Africa. There is also evidence of impaired cognitive functioning associated with substance use. Although this research, um, although research in this area in South Africa is really still in its infancy. So what kind of research should we be conducting with adolescents? Research shows globally that the majority of adolescents do not necessarily present with diagnosable substance use disorders or if they do, these are much more likely to be at the mild to moderate level. Therefore, the SBIRT, or screening, brief intervention, and referral to treatment model, is a suggested evidence-based level approach to working with adolescents. So, screening can quickly identify if there is a substance use problem and at what level this may be for the adolescent. Brief interventions not only provide the adolescent with opportunities to set their own goals around behaviour change, but also aim at working with adolescents to increase motivation to change substance use behaviour. And referral to more formalised treatment can also occur for adolescents who still need assistance with their substance use. Many of you may be familiar with the SBIRT model, but why would we use it or consider to use it in the South African context? Well, first of all, intervening early to prevent the development of more severe substance use disorders makes sense. The SBIRT model is a cost-effective approach, which is valuable in a resource-constrained setting, such as our country. Substance use brief interventions also do not have to be delivered by a specialist, and therefore task shifting is possible. SBIRT can also be integrated into routine healthcare, this could either be at existing structures or through decentralised care. There's also increased accountability from a range of players, including the adolescents themselves. 
So I'm going to just spend a minute or two talking about some examples of some recent, recent research studies that are either ongoing or um, have been recently completed that aim to address substance use amongst other issues with adolescents and young people. So if we look at this study over here, this is the Couples Health Co-op Plus Intervention. This is a two-session workshop and it includes working with young women and their primary male partner to address substance use and HIV. And this includes linkage to care for both partners, regardless of their HIV status. It is based on empowerment theory and it really focuses on improving communication amongst young couples and will target those um, in late adolescence as well as early adulthood. If we then look at this intervention, which is called RADPAL. Um, this stands for reducing alcohol and drug use and other problem behavior amongst adolescent learners. So I think the name of that study is quite self-explanatory, but it is based on stages of change, motivational interviewing, as well as cognitive behavioral therapy. It consists of two sessions with the adolescent and also has an optional session to work with the adolescent's main caregiver. Um, following research that indicates that this is a feasible intervention, as well as some preliminary positive outcomes in terms of significant reductions in alcohol use frequency, number of drinks per occasion, frequency of cannabis use, and engagement in delinquent type behavior, it is currently being piloted at a registered outpatient treatment facility in Cape Town to see if it can be implemented more widely with adolescents. Finally, the last study on the slide over here is the Young Women's Health Co-op. This focused on the efficacy of a comprehensive HIV testing, gender-focused program in reducing alcohol and other drug use, victimization and sexual risk behavior, um, and also aimed to increase uptake services for out-of-school adolescent women who use alcohol and other drugs and also had a strong empowerment framework. When it comes to the inclusion of adolescents, it is critical um, to include adolescents when planning research studies. So one thing that we've implemented more recently in our adolescent research studies is the establishment and feedback from our peer advisory boards who have really assisted us in adapting our work in the following ways. So first of all, have helped us to provide information on key issues that adolescents who use substances face, including access to health care around sexual and reproductive health, which is also very important for adolescents, mental health and other challenging behaviour. They've really helped um, us to provide input into study logos and names. If you look over here, this is our CHC Plus logo. Um, and actually, this was really designed um, with a lot of feedback from our peer advisory board in terms of the diagram, in terms of the shape, in terms of the color. Um, so really that, that logo is, is due to their um, feedback. Um, peer advisory boards have also really assisted with recruitment strategies. So how to reach adolescents in studies, especially when working in a number of communities. Then peer advisory boards have really um, also ensured that particular substances are addressed in our interventions. So the terminology that's used is relevant and current for adolescents. Um, and we've also taken the voices of adolescents and used them in intervention slides to really make it just um, more relatable to the adolescents that we will be reaching in our studies. We have also received very valuable feedback on intervention activities. So if we look at this picture in the middle, this is called the problem tree. And the problem tree really looks at um, the kinds of stigma that adolescents use substances and maybe living with other communicable diseases such as HIV may experience, as well as the effects that this can have in various um, aspects of their lives. Our peer advisory board helped us to test this activity um, and to see if it would work with other adolescents. Our peer advisory boards have also been extremely useful in assisting us with checking our materials and our instrumentation for studies in terms of language and timing, etc. 
Please note that we have signed consent from each individual to use any of the photos included in today's presentation. I think it's important to say that. I wanted to share this slide very quickly as well, um, where a recent peer advisory board meeting really assisted us with planning for the delivery of an upcoming intervention workshop. So ensuring that these workshops will be delivered in a fun way through using drama and play interpretation, including singing, um, as well as utilizing traditional community outreach, but also social media and technology to advertise these events was suggested by our peer advisory board. Furthermore, having someone who adolescents look up to the up in the community affiliated with these intervention workshops were strongly recommended. Our peer advisory board members also indicated a level of interest in assisting with the workshops themselves. In a recent study that I spoke about earlier, which entailed reaching adolescent girls who use substances and had left school early, we collaborated with a government organization in order to really be able to offer young women from the communities that we were going to be working in a daily stipend and a certificate indicating experience and research as part of the expanded public work, work program. So these were young women that were slightly older than um, the, the teenage or adolescent girls that we were going to be reaching, but they really assisted us in recru recruiting young women and selected EPWPs were also provided with the opportunity, if they were interested, to learn skills to co-facilitate interventions um, with our trained interventionists that address substance use, sexual risk, and issues of gender and violence. When working with adolescents who use substances and who often present with additional issues, it is critical to have the right complement of staff. So if we just look at this picture over here, um, this is a picture of um, our staff from a previous study that worked with adolescent girls. And it's really just key that staff are consistent um, and that staff understand that there's a lot of diversity in adolescents who use substances. It's not just one group um, that is the same throughout. Staff also need to be non-judgmental in their approach, regardless of their personal beliefs. It is important to be able to communicate easily with adolescents, um, but while still being genuine. And I suppose that uh, probably speaks a lot to adolescent-friendly health services in general, but it's extremely important when working with adolescents who use substances who have often experienced a lot of judgment. If we look at this picture over here, this is just a picture of a, a previous research study site um, for adolescents. And I think that, you know, it's great to be able to have adolescent friendly spaces. So having bright colors that are really comfortable, that are set up technologically. But what we actually found in our research study that sometimes just having a comfortable, safe space um, is enough for adolescents. It is also important to address stigma, as adolescents who use alcohol and other drugs experience discrimination from a number of sources. Here are some quotes from recently conducted research, or formative research, um, that was conducted with young people, as well as stakeholders who work with young people. So if we look at the first quote, we can see that this is really evidence of social stigma and how young people are treated differently and judged. Um, so, so this young person believed that um, their substance use is thought to be the reason for them living with HIV. Then if we look at the second quote, this is by a stakeholder, and this is an example of perceived stigma by adolescents. So stakeholders such as this healthcare provider acknowledged that adolescents often believe they will be judged because of their substance use, which is equated with irresponsible behavior even if this isn't always the case. So that perception is, is there for adolescents who use substances. So in conclusion, where to from here? I think that there are many exciting opportunities in the area of adolescent substance use in South Africa at multiple levels. So at an individual level, just continuing to conduct studies to be able to confidently estimate the true prevalence of adolescent substance use is key. 
equipping adolescents who uh, have been identified as having problems related to their substance use with the skills and the agency to be able to work on their goals, um, whether this might be reducing harm related to substance use or stopping substance use altogether with an evidence-based framework continues to be important. At an interpersonal level, conducting research that includes significant others in adolescents' lives is needed in South Africa, and this has started happening recently. So when we talk about caregivers, um, we may need to consider having a broader definition of caregivers, as often adolescents who use substances no longer live with a parent or a guardian, um, but may live with other family members. It is also um, important to consider at this developmental age that um, peers could be included in interventions. So especially those who also use substances, how can we reach them? Um, as well as what I spoke about earlier, so reaching sexual partners, because sexual partners may really influence substance use as well as in paid sex. Since adolescent substance use in South Africa occurs within a context that has so many structural issues that may drive substance use, evidence-based interventions need to continue to consider how to address these and to work within systems that are already often very burdened to reach those adolescents who use substances and who are particularly vulnerable. Incorporating stigma reduction into services who work with youth is important especially for adolescents who use drugs, but who also may face additional stigma at a number of levels. So for example, adolescents who identify as part of a gender minority group or those living with HIV. Lastly, it is somewhat challenging to consider how to include digital interventions into resource poor settings. Um, and if these are introduced, really how to make these sustainable. But since social media is increasingly being used as a way to reach adolescents um, who use substances, considerations around interventions in South Africa also need to include becoming more technologically advanced. Finally, while conducting randomized control trials is wonderful to test interventions for adolescent substance use and other challenges adolescents may face, scale up and implementation of these services is really the only way to create some sort of sustainable change. I would just like to end off by thanking you so much for your time. I look forward to answering any questions um, that anyone may have, but also please do feel free to reach out to me at tara.carney at mrc.ac.za for more information on any of the studies that I briefly introduced today. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Tara, for the excellent and clear presentation and the um, wonderful examples of um, the studies and also programs that are currently being conducted in um, South Africa. We now will move on to having a um, panel discussion. And we, I can see that there are already a number of questions in the Q&A and chat box. Um, so please, participants, do uh, put in your questions into the Q&A uh, chat box, if you could. We will be joined in this panel discussion by um, two other panelists, the first of which is Dr. Andrew Shibe, a medical doctor by training who works in harm reduction research programs and policy in South Africa and the region. His work focuses on the intersections between infectious diseases, determinants of health and rights. He's a technical advisor for TB and HIV care and also a researcher at the University of Pretoria. And our second panelist is Buyulwetu Balani, who is a clinical social, social worker who, um, with the South African National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependency and has had eight years of working experience in the field of substance use. Okay. Um, I will move on if we have all our panelists on. Yes. Yeah, we're good to go. All right. Um, the first question that I had um, very much earlier on is from Angelina Goy, who asks, in harm reduction in youth, 
why can't we add the, piv the pivotal ring as one of the prevention measures? And Sarah, I think you've indicated that you um, would like to answer this question. Sure, I can start. I'm sorry that I'm not on video. I'm not sure why my video is still not working, but um, that would, I guess I just want to say that was my oversight because it's not approved in the US. Um, and so I think that just might be sort of my um, presenting from sort of my standpoint and, and what tools are available um, to me in my, in my setting, but sort of would that then actually sort of defer back to other people on the panel about sort of whether or not that would be um, sort of appropriate to include. It sounds like it probably would be. Yeah, I think that is um, currently, a, and Andrew, I'm sure you're going to comment as well, but I think that is only being approved for 18 and older at the moment. That is, that's my understanding. Um, so I'm not sure if more work needs to be done with adolescents because it does really seem like a target group who would benefit um, you know, from this in, in terms of sexual and reproductive health, because we know that's, that's an area um, that is especially pertinent to adolescents. Andrew. Yeah, I was just going to also draw people's attention to the new WHO key population guidelines that were launched in um, at the AIDS conference a couple of months ago. And what's really great about them is their whole chapters around young key populations, and there is very good guidance around addressing substance use and its intersections. And I think one thing I would just like to highlight is that when we consider substance use like HIV, it's often we focus at the individual level, but not realizing that actually the interventions and the challenges are, are at the social and the structural level. And so often if we help people to address the other things in their lives, the substance use doesn't become such an issue. And there wasn't a lot of mention of mental health. And I think you can't separate mental health with well-being and emotional development, particularly during adolescence. Uh, because often that is one of the main ways in which people can express themselves, have pleasure, um, experiment in it through substances. So just wanted to flag the value of those guidelines and also remembering particularly in terms of interventions is that we should take a whole person approach. And often there are other things that are going on, particularly if there's high risk substance use and it's not actually the substance itself that needs to be addressed. Unfortunately, in South Africa, access to evidence-based interventions are very limited, uh, particularly in terms of things that are not only based on abstinence, they're almost non-existent. Um, and we really have to be aware of the limitations of an abstinence-only approach and why we should ourselves become aware of the evidence and really become advocates for access to things that that work and don't aren't punitive. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for um, that, that intervention and your broad overview um, of what needs to be done. I think your comment that in South Africa, there's not a lot of evidence-based um, interventions. It's not just in South Africa, I should say. It's, it's uh, pretty much most parts of the world. Um, did you also want to perhaps uh, more, before I get on to the other questions that uh, our participants have posted, did, would you also like to comment um, on any other aspects of uh, either Sarah's or um, Tara's presentations more generally? I think it was just important to highlight this concept of, of risk environments and knowing particularly with substance use, there are things of the individual, there are things of the substance and the things of the context that really contribute to, to the influence that that will have on an individual. And I really like the initial question around legalization and just understanding that the substance itself is one element of risk, but actually just using a substance in a criminalized environment really highlights the likelihood of overdose. Um, it really makes it so much more stigmatizing and hard to have accurate information. Uh, and then just the general well-being and, and kind of say development stage of the individual. I think the initial presentation showed how 
the developing brain and what people are doing in terms of a behavioral perspective is slightly different in adolescence. But there are also many of those factors that happen at any time in our life um, in terms of genetic factors, um, things linked to gender and how it's expressed. So when thinking of substances, it's not just the one element that we need to take into consideration. It's those three components. And using a harm reduction approach quite often, I think, is simplified just to examples of harm reduction interventions. But it's really working with the individual with the principles of harm reduction and seeing which things can we work with the people to reduce risks that are immediate and help people to really reach their, their long term goals. And I think when talking about adolescents, it's, it's how to reach their overarching potential and really the substances are, are just a component we have to help them work through. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. For your way too, did you want to comment on um, either of the two presentations before we move on to the other questions? Yes, I would. Thank you so much. A lot of things stood out for me during the two presentations, but the one thing that really stood out for me was the fact that for some adolescents, abstinence might not be the goal because in practice, our main goal is abstinence. So I got to see that it's important to focus more on harm reduction and also mitigating the risk factors. Another thing that stood out for me was um, stigmatization, how important it is for us as practitioners to destigmatize substance use, even the language that we speak, because what I've noticed in, in, in practice is that the stigmatization prevents our clients from disclosing the high, some of the high risk um, behaviors that they might be doing, because we must be cognizant of the fact that adolescents want to be uh, accepted, they want to belong, they want to be admired. So disclosing some of those risk factors and also the element of the stigma is not going to help in practice. So the element of destigmatization stood out for me. So that's a nice segue, really. Thank you for those comments um, into a question that we have on how and how do you destigmatize um, and approach harm reduction rather than reprimanding and patronizing? Because often you've got um, healthcare workers who um, are insensitive to these things. So anyone of the panel would like to take that question? Yeah, I mean, I think I... I can start if that's if that's okay. So I think in terms of um, stigmatization, I think adolescents are really facing a lot of sorry, uh, often moral judgment, um, you know, which is which is often accompanied with a, you know, you're not an adult, so that sort of lack of responsibility and accountability, um, you know, that very paternal or maternal attitude. Um, from a number of individuals. And I think it's, you know, we speak about healthcare workers and we speak about, you know, there are some, some great programs that have really worked to help um, with that destigmatization. But I think we also need to look at the community sometimes um, and what the community's perceptions really are around substance use. Um, just as an example, in one of our studies, we, our aim was to work with health, healthcare workers who work with adolescents, um, who use substances and who are coming in for sexual and reproductive health. But um, as we conducted our formative work, what we actually found out was, yes, that does exist. But even within families and within communities, there's a lot of misperceptions around substance use. Um, and there's a lot of judgment. And there's a lot of, um, for lack of a better word, gossip around individuals that are seen in engaging in substance use. Um, so I think it really needs to be multi-level. Yeah, perhaps uh, before I take the other questions, I, I'd like to jump in here, um, Tara, and then maybe Sarah and Andrew. Uh, how, you know, often um, when, when we have adolescents or young adults needing uh, care and help and treatment and support for their substance use, it, it, you wish that it could have happened um, earlier. So my question is, with all the self-stigmatized internal stigma and the criminalization and everything else that's going on. How, how, what is the first step? How do you draw them into 
um, care and support and treatment when you know you know that the, it, the intervention should happen much earlier. So I think it's a, a lot of denial yeah, often as yeah. well by both the individual as well as their families. Mm -hmm. I think it depends on the, in the context. I think where we have programs in operation, there's a big effort to ensure that the programs don't have barriers in terms of age restriction of when people can access. Uh, some of our, many of our harm reduction programs are trying to actively have young peers. So we've got a large global fund program operating in several, several um, districts, health cities. <clears throat> knowing that particularly young people uh, are most, most likely to contract a viral hepatitis C in the first year of injecting. Um, and I think what we didn't highlight is that we have a huge opioid epidemic in South Africa that's it's spoken by many words. It's called nyope, unga, wonga. And for a lot of time, there was a, kind of a denial that it was heroin and it was called um, antiretrovirals, but it's, it's opioids. And as we have now more and more people have dependence, we're seeing many more people inject. So I think it's just being aware that there are harm reduction services available and trying to get peers that are able to reach uh, younger people is important. And where there are school programs is to try and ensure that they are non-punitive. There's a big push, um, I think, of still using punitive approaches to managing adolescent use within schools. So they get forced to, non to compulsory treatment or they get expelled. Um, or people engage with law enforcement, which is never useful. Yeah, yeah thank um, you for that. Go so ahead. maybe I can just make a comment on that because I don't, when you have a 15 minute presentation, I don't know if you can always get through everything. But one of the things I did, I did want to highlight is those, those interventions in our research that we speak about. Um, the goal is really driven because it's motivational interviewing. The goal is driven by the adolescent. So if the goal for the adolescent is not reducing substance use, but maybe looking at how they could use substances in a safer way, you know, um, then, then that is sort of what we work with at the time. Um, yeah, Andrew, we are also starting to actually include um, some, source, some sort of safer injecting practices in our interventions, which we haven't before, um, because we are seeing it and we are seeing it in communities where you know, previously it wasn't reported at, at all and now it, it's coming up in our biological tests. Um, but I think there, there is a, I don't know if the word is discrepancy, but it's a, it's a challenge to um, sort of get everyone on board in terms of, I think when people hear harm reduction, often there are a lot of feelings evoked with it. Um, there are a lot of misperceptions, but really what it is is about, you know, if this adolescent is not ready to start using substances or does not see it as a problem, what are the other risks that we could sort of look at? Um, so yeah, so we don't always just look at abstinence in our, in our intervention programs. And I see Sarah has a hand up as well. Sarah, yeah, thanks for that. I just wanted to, I guess, like add to a couple of things, Tara and Andrew, that, that you've said that I think are just are so important. I agree it's hard in 15 minutes to sort of say everything you want to say. Um, but, you know, one thing, it, it, Andrew, a couple of comments ago, you were sort of talking about sort of how in a lot of ways the substance use necess isn't necessarily the issue. And I think it's just, it's been so, I think, humbling, to be honest, for me in this work as I've been sort of meeting more and more youth to really find how true that is. And I work in a medical setting, in a primary care setting, and yet like my role is like the least important most days actually. And that sometimes I think that we've, to be honest, like over medicalized a lot of thinking about this and it's really thinking about, you know, um, other sort of concrete needs, issues that are going on in the community that really need to be addressed by sort of policies, thinking about sort of improving access to high quality behavioral health and intervening early that are really the, um, what would probably, what would be more potent interventions for actually addressing the substance use rather than me sitting there and sort of talking to them about, you know, like, so tell me about your cannabis use. Like, that's just never how we start, you know? And I think this idea of destigmatizing is like, how, you know, there's this, uh, Terry, you said this sort of, you know, individual level interventions. And so for me, that's like, I thank people when they come in and it's like, thank you for being here. I appreciate it's a big deal for you to be talking to me about this. You don't really know me yet. I um, And also 
I guess like validating the ambivalence that comes around with substance use too, which I think is in normalizing it and sort of not pathologizing all these behaviors. I think that that is something that we do that really perpetuates stigma. Um, and for us, if there are ways to invite family, caregivers, guardians, community in to sort of, I guess, share this message of normalizing ambivalence, this idea that behaviors make sense and sort of focusing on those um, motivations so that we can try to be more responsive to what's going on with the youth. But I, and then at the same time, not, um, I worry about the, ri the risk of only focusing on individual level interventions when the reasons are so much broader than that and sort of somehow like blames the adolescent or sort of puts all the responsibility on the adolescent for fixing um, or addressing some of these issues when it's so much larger than them, um, so. Um, okay, I have a question from Tulani Matidani, um, and any of the panelists um, um, is welcome to answer this. How are we catering for low-income families uh, when rehabilitation services are normally very expensive? Um, this is from Zimbabwe. So yeah, I, th I think it's really important that everyone takes away this message knowing that no one is recommending inpatient rehabilitation for drug use. Um, I think it's very clear we want community-based, um, kind of say non-professional but trained people delivering interventions that can be effective. So the, the MI expert, the motivational interviewing a brief uh, referral for treatment are tools that are very well catered for social auxiliary workers, peer outreach workers, and those can be done with very little, if any, resources. So I think it's really important, particularly in countries where there are limited resources, that there isn't a focus to move that into the high expense inpatient rehabilitation model. And unfortunately, in South Africa, there's still an expectation that that's what we should be doing more of, rather than supporting and identifying people early so I think even though it's a Zimbabwean example, it, it's applicable in all places and finding ways of, of normalizing and asking about substance use using validated tools in all of your work is a very important um, intervention. And that's one way I think to identify people. It's starting where we already have those contact points and training people to identify people that have potentially comorbid mental health conditions, or those that um, have high risk that could benefit from access to prevention commodities. Um, and apart from the more expensive uh, pharmacological interventions, um, there aren't a lot of things that we can do with, with medical science for things other than opioids. So we really rely on support structures, um, low cost behavioral interventions that can be very effective um, and as well as mutual, mutual support opportunities. Yes, thank, thank you for that, um, Andrew. And once again, you know, this uh, concept of compulsory treatment services that's that's prevalent in Asia, Southeast Asia, or, um, you know, expensive inpatient rehab is, is ingrained in, in many people's minds and when we should really be intervening much earlier in the community, as you mentioned. Tara, you also wanted to respond. Yeah. Um, I think I just wanted to say two things in addition. Um, I mentioned very briefly about task shifting because I really think that's an opportunity in our country. Um, you know, especially as we're talking about all of these um, sort of comorbid issues that often occur together. So task shifting is starting to happen in mental health. It's starting to happen, you know, in HIV work. It is starting to happen very in, at a very small scale with substance use. Um, but I think expecting to have the professionals um, to deliver these services is not realistic in our context at all. Um, the other thing is, I think that there's sometimes an automatic expectation that formalized treatment for adolescents is what should happen. And I don't think that's always necessary. I think besides the fact that it's not always necessary, it's not always available. So that's another thing. Um, and brief interventions can actually be used, you know, when, when you have that window of, of motivation for change with an adolescent, even if it's a tiny seed, 
and you have that opportunity, you can provide a brief intervention for them, even if they're waiting to get into more formalized treatment. So I think it's just, um, you know, a perception of how we think about the services that we deliver. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And th thank you for that. Um, this is more of a comment than a question from um, Monica Kampuma, um, looking at the context of violence, especially in Cape Town, um, and how substance use is, a, is a really a reflection and coping mechanism to handle difficult emotions and trauma. Um, Tara or Andrew, um, I wonder if you, or, or um, anyone, I wonder if you wish to comment on that. Um, I'll, I'll ask you want to start? Comment. Oh, yeah. okay. So <laughs> sure, I'll start. Um, I just okay. wanted to also highlight um, an important thing that probably applies to many contexts is while there are the bulk of individuals that need um, or would benefit from low cost, low touch, face to face interaction, there are really good mechanisms for conditions or, or clients with more complex issues to be discussed and supported with specialists using virtual technology. So these um, kind of multidisciplinary remote um, clinical teams, ECHO is an example, are very well structured to help with substance use disorders. So the information can share between specialists and that is low cost and works in low income settings. So that also is possible in, in Zimbabwe and others. We use it in South Africa for our hepatitis programs. We don't yet have a substance use um, echo established, but we are planning to, to do one potentially with the University of the West of Cape Town. And then I just think the violence issue really highlights that for so many people, um, it is a means of coping and identifying and supporting people early is, is important, particularly if there's been significant trauma, because many of the people that really develop significant substance use later on in life, they've been exposed to high levels of trauma earlier on. Um, and I think it's really important in our context around the needs of women. And I think that's maybe something we didn't talk about enough is the important for gender appropriate responses to adolescence, um, particularly for the additive violence that affect women in South Africa and, and our region. And so our way that our substance use services must be gender responsive and they need to integrate you know, a much more holistic sexual reproductive health needs uh, of, of, young, of young gender diverse people as well as women. Yeah. Um, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for those comments. Sarah, go um, ahead. I think I can just add to that. So I think, um, you know, in terms of adverse childhood events or experiences, I think there's, there has been some evidence in our country that there is a big link between that and substance use, which makes sense, right? And using substance use as a coping mechanism. Um, and so I know we were working on an intervention that really integrated trauma um, and it was women focused because, um, you know, that was sort of who we were reaching. And um, I think we need to do more of that work because, um, you know, for me, I think trauma is something that really can't just be attack on. It needs to be sort of looked at really sensitively and in a very evidence based way, because it is something that, you know, you don't want to cause more harm. Um, so it has to be an evidence-based intervention. We have to do a lot more work around that, but um, it's a priority almost. And I agree with you, Andrew. Um, I wish I could have sp spoken more about um, gender because it's also a passion of mine. I think it's so incredibly important um, that we, we look at that as well with interventions. Yeah, thank you, Tara. There are a number of comments on the importance of involving adolescents in, in these programs, and um, we are aware too. I wonder if you would like to share with us your thoughts on this and um, some of the important ways in which we could really uh, meaningfully engage adolescents in, in designing these programs as well as delivering um, these programs. And others are welcome to jump in as well, of course. Definitely, adolescents should be involved in these programs, but also it's important for us to be fact that when they are involved in these programs, so I fully agree that adolescents should be in, involved in this program. Thank you. Anyone 
else with um, other thoughts on this? I guess, I, yeah, I just, oh, um, you know, I, I do think it's, I guess I just want to amplify the, the idea that it's really important. And I think that um, we are, you know, and I think, I, you know, this idea that they're hard to reach, like we're hard to reach. And so sort of like really trying to flip that script, I think is important. And I think the best, way, one of the, or one of the ways we can do that is by inviting and collaborating. And I think, um, you know, I know in my work sort of moving beyond like just even asking them, I've done a lot of qualitative work, but like beyond asking them, but actually inviting them to be youth to be partners and or like lead the work, you know, lead work that we're doing, um, I think is is really important. So ideas like peer advisory boards and that's what, um, yeah, we're waiting, we're, we're trying to actually, we're actually, we're applying for this grant where we would actually create an advisory board to develop a research framework that would really be led by youth and by their families um, so that they can truly be informing what questions are even important, what outcomes are even important, you know, because the assumptions that, you know, I have may be really off um, to be honest. And then that then our interventions are, are less, are less responsive to their needs. Um, and I think it's also a way actually to, to invite, you know, diverse representative youth to sort of get to this issue of ensuring that it is gender inclusive. And, um, and so that is another, you know, another way to address that. Um, yeah, I just, I think I just want to make two comments. I think really having a peer advisory board has been a bit of a game changer for us. And I think it is having a peer advisory board from sort of the implementation of when you're still sort of developing the idea for your study. So straight from there and having this participation throughout in many different um, areas. And I think something that just struck me was the potential as well, like these our peer advisory boards, like we see them as ambassadors. Um, and so it is, it is really a group of young people who are, you know, interested in the work and who, who want to, and, you know, things do change, but who kind of want to come to a meeting and, and join activities on quite a regular basis. Um, so I think that makes a big difference. And I, I went to a talk the other day and they were actually saying from a big study and having a peer advisory board, those members have actually started their own sort of youth NGO, which was amazing for me to hear because I think it is also just about sustainability um, and about those youth then really taking it forward. Uh, I just wanted to, to also highlight a caution is that not everyone that, that proclaims to have connectedness really has connectedness. So we have to just be careful that the, the principle of engaging the people who the issue affects in the work that we do is important, but ensuring that those people who join actually have connectedness. So this is important in the area of substance use because particularly with adults, there's a historical trend of getting people with previous experience to kind of be involved in, in service delivery or research. And often they're out of touch with the realities and the issues affecting people. And as a result, there's no resonance in, in what they have to say or, or their ideas. So there's definitely a place for those people who are still using substances and those people who might be at risk, uh, can I use the word at risk, or might not be using substances, or those that might previously have used them at, at higher risk. So there's a, a, just to be cognizant of the different voices that are required to get perspectives, and also knowing that the issues that affect people who use methamphetamine might be different to people who inject opioids. Young people who engage in sex work won't be the same as the issues affecting young men who have sex with men. So I wanted to also just bring the attention to, to an organization called Youth Rise, which is a, a drug policy and harm reduction international NGO that focuses on issue for young people. And I think that could also be um, tapped in. And there are some chapters, uh, at least in Nigeria and South Africa and other places, for people to learn more around harm reduction in young people and advocacy. 
Thank you, Andrew. Those are really, really good points. And Monica has uh, also put in the chat group that there is also a need to advocate for, there's a great need to advocate for adolescent-specific programs to the Department of Health. Um, and currently these programs are partner dependent and um, there's an issue with sustainability when these partners leave. Um, that's, that's a very, very important point. Now, in the remaining few minutes, I, I just wanted to touch on um, uh, one issue which I, you mentioned that in South Africa, cannabis is decriminalized, but for many other places around the world, including um, my own, um, all um, the, of these drugs are still criminalized and which brings an issue to when you manage adolescents and the issues around confidentiality. Um, how do you navigate um, all of that um, in, in you know, trying to provide them with treatment and support? Um, one is the, the age limit and the other is of course um, the criminalization of yeah, I think I think this is really interesting. And I, I think that this is an area where maybe in a year, we would probably have more to say on it. Um, because I mean, it's really something that's that's just happened. But, you know, the fact that, you know, it is for adults, and not for adolescents. So what does that mean? So we really want to start looking at things like, okay, you know, is treatment increasing for cannabis amongst adolescents? Because, you know, what we do see is in terms of the research that it's very different and it probably relates, you know, Sarah, to what you were saying in terms of the brain, you know, developing until age 25, that the adolescent brain is very different and the effect that cannabis might have is different to adults. So I think this is going to really become an area, especially in South Africa, that people are going to start focusing on. Um, we are starting, um, we, what we want to do is we want to actually start tracking the trends from, um, you know, before the decriminalization amongst adults until afterwards in treatment and just start looking at that. Um, yeah, but I think it's an area that we're going to hear a lot more about. We just actually don't know enough, I don't think. Mm, you're right. Yeah. Andrew? Yeah, you know, there's so many problems with our data. Uh, there's no differentiation between people that have been diverted there because the court says so and those that schools. actually have a substance disorder. <laughs> um, so just look at those trends with all the inherent biases. Um, I think as service providers, we have an obligation to ensure that there's no age restriction provided on access to any harm reduction services. And I think that kind of our framework enables. I think we have to be very careful that we should not be doing harm. So we should always be asking, even asking basic demographic questions, will it be in the person's benefit? And even if that means don't ask about age, so that the person is not having a barrier to access care. Um, you know, it's a lot more clear cut when there's clearly harm or where there's clearly um, the risks. And I think that's where the ethical dilemmas come in. Um, there are I'm not a social worker, so maybe um, evaluator can, can talk about. There are quite a lot of specific things of what social workers need to have for special training to work with young people, which again are actually well intended, but they actually often end up being barriers to who can provide services to, to individuals. Um, so working with young people is an important thing and it's only going to become more of an issue. And that's also because Life is changing, substances are much more available now than they would, they've become normalized. Um, not all substance use is, is bad. And I think also we have to acknowledge that. Uh, understanding that maybe delaying onset of use rather than focusing on, on preventing use is a much more um, realistic approach. Uh, and I think our policies are nowhere there yet. We still think of a, of a drug-free society. Um, so yeah, um, we've got a long way to go from a progressive approach to policy in South Africa, mm. despite the decrim of cannabis. Yeah. Mm. Indeed. Um, Sarah, did you have um, anything to add to that? I actually do. I have something to add more, especially when it pertains to confidentiality, because when you work with adolescents, in, in most cases, it's the parents who bring the adolescents to the organization because they have noticed 
significant behavioral changes. So you have to, because adolescents are entitled to their confidentiality. So now the parents will want to know what is happening, what drug are they using. So it's very important to explain the ethical aspects of confidentiality to the adolescents and also explain limits to confidentiality because during, uh, during the intervention, if the adolescents discloses that they are thinking of committing suicide, engaging in high risk behavior, then that is when with their permission, with their consent, they have to have they have to sign consent to release that information to the parents. So when it comes to confidentiality, it's very tricky and it should be uh, handled with so much sensitivity, prioritizing the rights of the adolescents to their confidentiality. Thank you for that. And um, Sarah, very quickly, you. did you have anything to add? I did not actually. I think I was all right. Good. Okay, thank you very much. And um, you know, we've really come to the end of this excellent session. I, I've certainly personally learned a lot, and uh, it's been a really wonderful and, and rich um, presentations as well as discussion. Um, thank you very much to Sarah and Tara for the. Excellent presentations, and Andrew and and for um, the, the discussions. I think for me, the the take home message was certainly, um, although that you know we were discussing the situation in sub-Saharan Africa, in particular in South Africa, but the issues really are global, um, and uh, you know the the substance use in adolescents. Uh, first of all, need to um, we need to be aware that. Um, it's complex. Um, it's not just the individuals, but you have society and environment uh, playing a big role in terms of um, the risk in the first place. And therefore, in terms of the interventions, one not only focus on the individuals, but really um, the environment around them, including um, history of trauma and violence um, that precedes uh, substance use, uh, poverty, and, and all those uh, risk factors that put um, adolescents at um, high risk of, of substance use in the first place, and therefore those underlying factors will also need to be addressed. The importance of um, uh, language, we haven't had much time to uh, discuss this, but in terms of uh, the language that we um, healthcare providers use, so not to exacerbate the um, stigmatization and the um, discrimination that uh, people who use drugs, in particular adolescents who are undergoing um, all kinds of, of pressure, um, including the, the um, natural um, development stages that they have to go through. But as uh, Tara shared with us, there are some um, really important interventions um, and, and, and uh, both Sarah and, and Tara shared with us evidence-based interventions that um, can be implemented, um, hopefully at a very early stage so that one doesn't um, reach the, the crisis point that you often see um, adolescents and young adults going through. Um, uh, in terms of their substance use. And uh, many of these interventions can be deployed uh, using task shifting, their evidence base. It can be deployed even and implemented even in resource uh, limited settings. So um, there's much to be um, positive about. Unfortunately, I think many of these interventions are also not very well known. And um, through ideological and decades of, um, um, I guess, um, policies uh, that, that um, um, put abstinence um, at the, as a goal, um, we, we kind of, um, we meaning the, the global world, um, have not uh, embraced harm reduction and then many of these uh, interventions that are much more effective as well as cost effective and, and does, you know, instead we've been focusing on um, very, well, ineffective and, and, and um, interventions that are punitive and have caused a lot of harm, not just to individuals, but to society. So, um, thank you very much, um, Sarah, Tara, Vilawetu, and Andrew for your very insightful presentations and comments. Uh, as I said, um, I've learned a lot and um, certainly 
um, the discussions that we've had today is not only applicable to um, South Africa, but to the world over in terms of how we move forward with this um, important problem of substance use, not just in adolescents, but um, in, in individuals all over the world. So thank you to the Desmond Tutu Foundation for inviting me to chair this. And um, we hope we can continue this engagement for the benefit of all. Good afternoon. And, and thank you participants for joining in this uh, presentation today. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Bye. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Goodbye. Thanks, everyone. Goodbye. Bye.